thank you very much for coming tonight. I, I, I don't take personal credit for your attendance. I think it's probably more the subject matter that's had you brave the Irish weather, which I think is very fitting considering where I'm from, that uh, Mother Nature threw a bit of rain on us today. Um, we're going to move pretty fast. I, I think, you know, I'm going to try and cover this off in about three quarters of an hour. You could spend a whole day on, on this and still have stuff left over to speak about. Uh, it, it, it's such an encompassing and an important subject matter. Um, it, it, it really is what I believe to be the most com important competitive advantage you can achieve going forward, particularly in the next 10 to 20 years, because not only taking the pending boom that we're, we're hearing about every second day, but just also perhaps some generational idiosyncrasies of population now that we're, we're heading towards. We're, we'll talk about that in, in, in later slides. Um, in addition to the, the kind words that were said about me. Um, I came out from Ireland in 99. Uh, I call Australia home now. I was just talking to some people beforehand saying uh, I, I stumbled across paradise and decided not to leave. So I consider Ireland now a fantastic place to go on holidays. Uh, much to my friends' dismay, we're back there finding it pretty tough right now. But um, I got two kids who call Australia home. We love it. We absolutely love Perth. So I got a passion for Perth working. I got a passion for WA working. and. and building a sustainable future for our kids, and I mean that uh, particularly from uh, a talent and, and a recruitment and retention viewpoint. Um, you know, th this probably says what we're about, so, so for just to get the um, self-description out of the way so we can really concentrate on the subject matter, uh, we are just all about looking everywhere for perfect candidates for our clients. I'm not going to say it's 100% achieved, but it's 100% attempted. Uh, we, we'll go everywhere from you know, local press and local print advertising right across the globe to look for people from markets where we believe there's a larger supply of talent. I'll touch on that a lot today um, and, and really try and fire through. I really want you guys to, to feel comfortable to ask any questions at the end as well because I really believe that's where a lot of people get value. So I'm committed, unlike uh, the, the Irish way, I'm committed to practicing brevity as much as I can to get us uh, enough time for questions at the end. So what I want to achieve for you guys tonight is you probably noticed in the flyer, I call it next day applicable value. I'm big into that. I think that it's great to come to a seminar and get loads of theory and then walk away and spend six months to try and put it into practice. I want you guys to be able to put it into practice tomorrow. Um, building a passion for doing it well. Uh, can I ask a question just to the audience, just for me to get a feel for, it, for what's in the room? How many people here would recruit almost every day? Party, almost part of your job is recruitment every day. Okay. How many people are in a line manager, a line executive role where you are indirectly responsible for the talent coming into your organization? Okay. How many people love recruiting? Seven. Okay. If those seven could... <laughs> uh, I, I don't... I, don't uh, I, think, I think recruitment is often the scourge of HR professionals. Um, it, it's, it's something that we're passionate about. I hope that comes across tonight. I love it. I'm, it's, it's masochistic. You're dealing with the only product in the world that can change its mind. Uh, you don't buy a dishwasher in, in, in Harvey Norman and go, go home and it decides to be a washing machine. Although some men might think it is. Uh, I have been accused of that in the past. Um, do, not put, do not put porcelain in, in, uh, in a washing machine. But, you know, it's, it, it is something that uh, when you get it right, there's a huge sense of achievement of it. Uh, I think that everyone in our business loves that. And I know there's a few people from recruitment companies and you, that, that will probably echo with you. you the, the sense of challenge that's involved and it gives you a real sense of accomplishment when it's done right. I would just like to build a 1% more passion. And that, I'm a big 1%. Michael Dell always says, make your business 1% better every week. I love that term. I want you to be 1% more passionate, 1% better, and 1% more mindful. Recruitment mindfulness is basically understanding the process during the process. So it's having a conscious awareness of what you're doing at different stages of the process. I should mention now, there are certain slides that I will uh, give to AIM to put on the website because you'll probably look at them and you may or may not think they're little nuggets that you can use in your business. It is our intention to share that. It is our IP. We don't care. Our passion is to make businesses better um, and, and that's part of it. So I will be putting um, some slides up and I believe that the film of tonight's, go is it going to Hollywood or staying in Perth? Is it staying in Perth for now? All right, I give Dennis Farrell a run for his money, or Colin Farrell. So that will be up there as well in case you want to recap because we will move pretty fast tonight in, in what we do. I thought I'd just share with you probably one of the reasons and, and you'll all, it'll all echo with you from employees that you've seen in your business. When I was about 19 and I was in university in Ireland, I went and got a job in like an IGA in Dublin. 
and I must have been the worst employee they ever had, right? It was a fruit and veg shop. It wasn't difficult. It was like, move the apples down the front that we put out last week, move the new ones up the back. I went brain dead overnight. And I remember, it, and I only thought about this when I was doing this presentation, and, and someone said to me, uh, why did you get into recruitment? And I said, I think it might have been the, it was called Nolan's Supermarket, right? If you know the owner, you can check him out. I was, he won't even remember me. But I did a summer, and I remember they were so disengaged with me, and I was so disengaged with them that I was, I was cycling to work one morning. So the supermarket was about three miles away from where I lived. And a car pulled out in front of me, and I rolled over it. And, you know, I wasn't hurt, but I was really pretty shook up. And I walked in, and they, they said, I was five minutes late, and they said, where were you? And I said, oh, I just fell off my bike. I actually was in a crash. Uh, and I was like, my forehead was cut, and I kind of had half the road on my face, so I looked interesting for an Irish person. Black goes very well against the Irish white when you've got bitumen on you. And, uh, and they said, all right, yeah, whatever, just go to your job. Now, they weren't bad people. It was just such a disengagement. Oh, I was so bad yet I was top 10% of my class in my degree. I went on to a graduate program at the bank and I've done reasonably well in every job since, but I sucked. So I think somewhat, I use that word masochistically, I kind of just got into the industry to ensure that none of you guys got a Brian Briscoe in a supermarket, you know? And, and you've, all, you've probably all seen it where someone comes on such high recommendation, the references were brilliant, they come into your organization and they are a waste of oxygen. And you wonder how you got it so wrong. And then they go on to the next job, and you see them a year later, and they got three promotions, and you're like, am I, have I gone barmy? Have I met this person's twin brother? And I, that's, that's who I had. We've all had it. And the whole idea behind getting better at recruitment and getting better at, at, at attracting and retaining talent is somewhat to avoid that, um, because it, it's so easy to happen, and I was a personal example of it. So just hope and pray you don't get a Brian Briscoe in your fruit and veg store. Just to give a little bit, I want to just give a little bit of background before we go into the step-by-step -step, um, solutions. I, I just had a conversation with someone before about how hard it is to um, now get grads into your business and allow them time to settle in before they leave in two and a half years if you're lucky. It is very, very much a, a changed environment. And I know 1970 is a long time ago for some people, but you know, back in the 70s, you could recruit someone and you had them for 12 years. If it took a guy, let's say, 12 months to settle in, well, it was only 10% of his tenure or her tenure with you was the settling in period. 2011, it's now four years. If you're going to go with stereotypical statistics, anyone under the age of 29 in your business is average going to last 2.6 years in your business. Now, I, would most people agree that uh, when you've got a staff member, they've left the building before they leave the building? Right? Sometimes 2.6 years earlier, right? So the minute they walk in, they've started to leave. Um, you know, it, it is a real challenge for businesses now to in that 2.6 years, and I know it's only statistics, some will last a year, some will last six years, but how do you get more people into your business and, and, and staying in your business for longer? The encouraging part of this, because this can be a bit of a bleak statistic, but you increase your retention of, of one more year, you're getting 20% more out of an asset. Now, I, I will refer to human capital as an asset at times. I don't mean it in a, in a commoditized way, but they are, at, at, you know, at times, your greatest asset. Most times, your greatest asset. So you get a year more out of that asset, you're 20% 20, 20 up. You're 36% up on your Gen Y assets. So it's very obvious you can make marked improvements in your business just by increasing that, that 10%. Now, based on top grading is, is, a, is a recruitment philosophy um, in, started in the States. We practice it in our business now. It's built by a guy called Brad Smart. He has worked out the cost of a mishire. So, you know, juggling and shoveling the numbers into equations and coming out with this. If you increase your retention by 10%, you've got $18,000 per staff member saving per annum. Now, the way I always look at this is, let's say you've got 10 staff. You've now increased your retention by 10%, and you don't need to increase your bottom line. You don't care about the cost saving. You just want to keep people longer. You now have $180,000 available to you. And what I'd say to you is, if you were given $180,000 with 10 staff to spend on staff retention, if you spent it wisely, your staff retention go up, right? So you can see this lovely cycle that forms. You increase staff retention, you save bottom line, which is you know, cost of mishires and cost of losing staff. You then, rather than add it to the bottom line, you get to decide, well, what do we want to reinvest? So instead of reinvesting uh, company profits in the business, we we're going to reinvest staff retention profits in staff retention. And you can start to build a bit of a cycle. Now, that's, I know it sounds simplistic, but when you put numbers on it, you start to realize how I talked today about that 1% better. 
Well, if you walked out of here and I thought that, uh, you know, if every person in here was going to get 1% better at recruitment, and that was going to give them $1,800 per staff member just by getting 1% better, that's a reasonably good return on your time investment. Now, that's the way to look at it. I think it starts to, to gather importance beyond just it being difficult when you can see the numbers behind it. Since we're in the middle of Wimbledon, I thought I'd use this because knowing your environment is the absolute first phase in getting your recruitment and retention better. So I want just kind of Tourette's back at me here, right? Um, intelligible Tourette's, if such a thing exists. I want us to build a perfect tennis player. So when you almost picture me either being a HR manager coming to you going, all right, John, what do you need? Or I'm an agent coming to you going, right, great, you've given us the job, let's go, give me the brief, okay? And then I'm going to ask you lots of questions that you're going to be pushed into saying yes or no to. So if I was to build the perfect tennis player for your business, or just the perfect tennis player, I'd say, well, is he going to be tall? Pro it would help, right? Probably. Right? Won't be scuddy. Be tall. Will he have a bloody strong serve and serve lots of aces? Yeah? Would he be strong at the net? Would he, you know, really good volley or rarely gets beat in the net, runs up to the net, point one. So he'd be strong at the net? He'd, he'd probably have a, you know, a really, really fierce shot, either a forehand or a backhand. And his temperament would be fantastic. You know, just unbelievable, never loses his cool, never gets hot-headed. We enjoyed McEnroe, but we don't want him in our business, right? Uh, he's nice in the competitor's business that you get to go and have drinks with at an industry function, but you don't want him to come home with you. So, you know, we can keep going with that, right? And this is actually what happens to a lot of companies at briefing stage or at stage of, all right, what do we need? Margaret, go and recruit it, fantastic. Or, you know, Margaret's the CEO who says, right, I think, okay, well, hang on, let's just get Roger Federer or let's get Pete Sampras. Now, what happens is you do that all the time. We see clients do this all the time and we rewind them back. And, you know, I, then you start to go, well, what if I got you someone who was one foot smaller, who doesn't serve many aces, who uh, isn't that strong at the net, who's a little temperamental, got a two-handed backhand, uh, his shorts are too tight, keeps pulling them out of his, it's going to annoy you. It's going to offend some of you. Know. But you forgot to mention to me that your surface is clay. And you didn't even think that your surface was clay. You just went and found the best tennis player. You just went and found Pete Sampras, Roger Federer, Bjorn Borg. You found, never found the best player for your business. You've just found second, third, fourth, or fifth, or tenth, or fifteenth. And it's, it's a very obvious analogy. But Rafael Nadal is the champion on clay. You just forgot you were playing on clay when you went and started to think about who you wanted for your business. You went out and built the stereotypical best candidate, not the best candidate for your surface. So one of the key things about recruiting is actually understanding the surface you play on. Because if you don't, you're always going to be recruiting what we call the stereotypical best rather than the best for your business. So Nadal is somewhat temperamental, but what Nadal has that I, well, you know, this is all opinion and conjecture, which is what recruitment is largely. But He's got loads of intangibles. He's got an amazing aggression. He's got a two-handed backhand that's just so annoying on clay, and he's somehow brought it to grass. You know, so you start to look at, well, what is the perfect candidate in my business? And it is the example of the fruit and veg shop. I was, I was like off the ATP tour of fruit and vegetable merchandising, right? But then I got into this thing that I loved, which was investment banking, and I soared because it was just an environment. It was my clay, and it suited me, um, whereas something else didn't. Now, your ability to understand the surface you're offering to the marketplace is so important in getting the right candidates. So with that in mind, and I always want to preface that because you've got to look at the whole thing inside the context of what is my surface. Because if you don't, you then start to now completely stereotypical all of this to any surface. Understand wh whether you're clay, hardcore, grass, cement, which is what the tennis courts in Ireland were. So, I thought I'd share this with you. We see the seven deadly sins of recruiting, uh, and we see them all the time. And we as a business have put this together. I think that's important. I'm the spokesperson for what 20 consultants see out there in the marketplace. So here we go. Nod internally if you do this. You'll probably do all seven of them. Rushing the process. We'll talk a bit about that. Trying to fill a role quickly. Loose brief or no brief. Don't really know what I was looking for. Went and looked for it anyway. Limited pool per choice. The best hiring decisions get made when you've got the highest number of quality candidates to pick from. How often do you have that? Casual interview process. A lot of interviews are actually chats. They happen in busy cafes. They're not interviews. Ignoring the two-way process is another big sin that we often see where you're not understanding the candidate's testing you as well as you testing the candidate. 
assuming dollars are everything, so just putting money at the problem, putting an offer that's 15 grand more than they're on and they refuse the offer and you can't understand it. Well, you probably, and we'll talk about that, we'll talk about getting into candidates' worlds during the process. There is something that I should um, stress here, and, and it, none of this is going to take you years to develop. You can, if you want to, right? You've got a recruitment department in your company of 50 people, they could develop this over years. My belief is that you can develop a lot of this quite quickly. It is a little bit like riding a bike that there's, you know, there's competency, there's ability, there's mastery. It's not going to take you long to do this. It's just that recruitment mindfulness. The last one is search, selection, disillusion. Um, I, a great example of that is I had a client who a uh, brilliant reputation in the marketplace, actually a very good recruitment process. Um, and I'm not saying that because we were involved. They actually themselves had, they put themselves forward very well. And then the person would walk in and get handed their desk, their phone, right, we'll see you. You know, there was a little bit of an orientation process. There's the toilet, the emergency exit, welcome, bye. Search, selection, disillusionment. You've ruined your whole process. So that's a big sin. I think a lot of, a lot of people think they've done their job at selection and the person's in. Uh, and we'll talk a bit more about that now in, in later slides. This is a busy slide. I don't have many busy slides, but this is a busy one because I'm, I'm allergic to death by PowerPoint. But really, this is what we see. And this is what becomes the seven-point talent plan. Uh, you'll notice, for those that are atten you know, high attention detail, we had a ten-point talent plan. But when I really started to prepare this presentation, I realized it's actually just seven points. So I haven't robbed you of three, I promise. I've just amalgamated them. So I won't read through that. We're going we're to basically spend about 20 minutes now um, going through each of these one by one so you can get to see where this how to stay sin free actually appears in the process. So we start with anticipating the need. Now when I say anticipate the need, I don't mean I think we might need someone in a couple of months time. That's the easy part. The anticipating the need is really about getting your house in order before you go out to market. So we kind of start with that and then we'll move, we'll move forward in, in that, in that um, cyclical direction. This is something that um, there are companies that will come and talk to you about this, but I want to just really do a kind of a, a two minute on, on, on candidate branding. Um, when we see the recruitment process start to finish, I believe, and, and, and you know, someone said to me that's in the marketing game, inconsistency is the enemy of brand. I think it's a brilliant term. Uh, it's something that we've really, really worked on in, in, in the four years. Um, that we've had the businesses we've really wanted to stay consistent. Your candidate brand, I believe, is a lot about consistency. So your values and what you are as a company, I'm sure, you know, how many in this audience would have values of some description, core values or employee values or, okay, good, that's a good amount, right? So I think a lot of companies have employee values and what ends up happening is they get mentioned at interview and then they get mentioned at induction. But nothing in the process resembles the values at play. So your, your, your ad has not exuded the values. It might have listed them, but it's, it hasn't given people the feel for them. So what are they and how would they look to a stranger? The reason why I say how they would look to a stranger is there's probably only 10 to 20 brands in Australia that people already have a listening of their brand as a candidate when they go and apply. There's a lot of brands in Australia, and a lot, I've seen the guest list for them, a lot of companies in this room like ourselves who, you know, every second or every third or every fourth person in the marketplace may not know who you are or what you're about. So you've got to think about how your values are going to look to a stranger. As we run through the process, you'll see how this comes in a lot. Then your process needs to be consistent with that. So I'll use a very obvious example. If one of your values to your employees, you want, you want your employees to feel that they're part of a relationship-based employer-employee partnering environment. Yet, and I'd say more than half here would have that some kind of strain of that as your value. Yet your recruitment process is transactional, a bit cold, a bit jumpy. Uh, thanks for coming in, we'll ring you tomorrow. Four days later you ring them. Completely inconsistent with your relationship partnering value. So you've got the candidate confused and surprised and no wonder candidates fall out of processes because they go, you lied. They don't tell you that, they just go, I found another job. They haven't, they just found the one they're in. They realize it's not too bad and they stay. So. That consistency is so important through the process. And it's just, again, it's that recruitment mindfulness. It's just being aware of how you are presenting different parts of your process to the candidate. Um, candidates should feel honored uh, in, in whatever way that means to you, right? So honored for you may mean prompt response. It may mean respect. It may mean communication. Whatever that means for you, right? Um, and then what actually happens is the result is that the candidate walks in 
to your, you know the way bosses say, just don't surprise me, right? You know, kids love routine. And I could keep going through every kind of demographic in the, in the marketplace. People actually like a little bit of predictability, particularly when you're about to jump job, because it's quite a stressful, traumatic experience at a scale of somewhere between one and 10. But it's never a very relaxed experience. And if someone says, oh, I just change jobs, I'm like, you're lying. That would have been a bit, you know, nervy or whatever. So when you get someone that walks into your workplace on day one and goes, yeah, this is what I expected. You've started your retention on day one. And the reason why I think a lot of companies, and we see this a lot, we see clients go, oh, listen, can you, go, can, I need you to recruit me a project manager, because we had one, but he didn't accept our offer. I, I always say you never had him, right? And it, it's gonna happen, but you probably never had him. You just had someone that looked like they might take a job with you and they didn't. What happened in the process? Something happened on the way to heaven that if you go back to the first phone call, you told the market that you were just warm and friendly and then he got a battle axe on reception when he called. And at that moment he went, I'll still apply but I'm not taking this job, subconsciously. So it's so important to get that process driven through based on what values you hold dear. Can people resonate with that and how often it can get missed in a process? It's, it's, it's on the wall, it's in your brochure. Yeah, a candidate doesn't see it, he, he reads it. Or, you know, she walks into an interview and she goes, okay, I thought this was gonna be friendly. I'm sat here for 25 minutes waiting for the person to turn up. So important. Um, this, if you, don't get, if you don't get conscious of this, forget about getting it right, because you're never gonna get it perfect. It's, it's almost least wrong, you know. But if you don't get this right, you are building a house on a bed of sand with no slab. So this and knowing your surface is so important before you go to market. I just thought I'd share this really quickly. If anyone's wondering about, oh God, is my role that important? Um, if you look at the top five things candidates are looking for, and, and, and you know, this is part of the big C candidate survey right across the country at all level, generational and, and, and industry. Quality of management, career development, and workplace environment are all very easy to make decisions on through the recruitment process, right? Because I meet, you know, I meet you and you're interviewing me and I go, this guy's a good guy. And, and, and I get a feel for that it's gonna develop my career and make me better as a human being by joining you. Well, you can see kind of how salary, yeah, it's important, but I've now got, you know, 45%, 43%, 41%, those all give me a big tick. So then you don't need to throw dollars at the problem. Now, I'm not suggesting that you can get salary and competitive, but you know, you can start to see the critical role that a, man a recruitment manager, whether you're a HR person, if you're a recruitment consultant, you are an extension of your client's brand. So you've really got to keep an eye on the critical role that you play in candidates. They are making a decision about you before they hear salary. Right? It's almost like if you get all the rest of it right, salary just needs to fit. The amount of times that we've seen clients get candidates over the line for a pay decrease because the candidate has seen quality of management, quality of environment, job security, and career development. So it's only one of five. It really just gives you a good feel for how critical your role is from start to finish in the process. Now this, I think, is a semi-groundbreaking technology in the recruitment game, right? But so obvious. Um, I, I'm, not, I'm, not, uh, I'm not suggesting uh, a name and shame here, but how many people in this room would once a year even pick your top 10% of your company and go and ask them, why do you work for us? Isn't it obvious? You know, isn't that a really obvious thing to say? Because you go, this is the Irishness in me, right? We've got a really good, you know, project manager. And Angela's been with us five years and she's just a top performer. We want more of her. Let's go and find it. Let's not ask Angela why she works for us. <laughs> it's staggering. But it's just operational demands that you don't want to disturb and you're on this kind of treadmill of recruitment that you never get off and it, you know, it's the definition of stupidity is to do the same thing again, expecting a different result, yet the entire world does it. But it, it is fantastic to be able to, first of all, and I, I would just invite you guys tomorrow, pick someone in your business that you think is a top performer and ask them these three questions. And I guarantee you, you will be enlightened. I guarantee it. Because we do it. We go and take a brief from a client and we go, who's your best person in that role? Let's meet them. And we ask them these questions. We have our ad from it. Now, I'm not, it, it's obviously a little bit kind of linear. You, you, you want to get a pattern because 
people will have applied for your role or heard and when I say applied I don't mean to an ad I mean a friend might have told them I mean you, you know you might have been out at a, at a function you met someone they are lodging their interest in working for you in some form of communication whether it be a CV or oh, I'd like to talk to you again or hey friend can you tell your boss I wouldn't mind working for you that kind of thing right so why did you join us why do you like the company why do you like your role that can be either or because you usually get the same answer to both questions and what should we stop doing so for those that are, are, are um, in, in you know readership mode um, Jim Collins in a Harvard Business Review article said rather than worry about what you need to do to motivate your staff just start to look at what you could do to stop demotivating them and a great thing to find out from your from your top performers regardless of how you're going to go and recruit others is what could I get out of your way that would make you even better right now you ask, let's say you've got 50 staff. You've, if you've got 50 staff, you've probably got seven or eight really top performers. You ask all of them that question. You've started to find out what it would be that would, what, what you could have in an ad, what you could be putting out to an agency, what you could be putting out to the market in some respect that would have more top performers be attracted to what you've got to offer. Yet what actually happens is companies go to market with kind of the middle bit of their company, right? It's almost like no one writes an ad to find the people you want to sack. And not, but equally, I don't think many people go to market with the message that will attract the top performers. So for me, that is just like, I promise you no one else outside this room is doing that apart from a few. That's my belief. I don't think many companies do this. So it's a nugget. Um, anyone that's here from recruitment companies, don't tell the recruitment companies, all right? Keep it to yourselves. Keep it as your competitive advantage. This is a nugget because this really allows you to replicate and duplicate top performers in your company. It doesn't necessarily mean you're going to run one ad, get one candidate, but boy, does it really increase your chances. And the problem that you've got when you're in recruitment is that often when you've been with the company a while, you don't see the wood from the trees. You don't actually get what it means to work for your company. Uh, and that doesn't mean you've lost passion. It probably just means you've lost visibility. So you, you really got to try and get a feel from inside your company what's making people tick. Now, I would even do this cross-generational. So I would, I separate Gen X as baby boomers, relatively similar traits in, in, in the workforce at the moment. Top performers, Gen X and baby boomers. I'd find, that, I'd find out that top 10% from them. And then I'd be asking my Gen Ys. Because I'll give my age away, I'm only 35. I'm not very good at understanding what Gen Ys want. They're only seven years younger than me. All right, so it, they're very different. And I think what happens is we do ride ads and we do put ourselves out to market assuming that we're gonna, 22 year olds, we hopping out of IGA to get that role and we don't get them you know we get with the greatest respect we get people 20 years older and we go oh god I wrote free iPod on your first day I thought well, that would have worked and you know that that's that's boring on the stupid but it is really about understanding what's going to make them tick um, that should take eight minutes per staff member so an hour gives you seven people in your business answering those three questions write them down now you've actually got what your business is attractive for. And then the next thing, and this is one of the slides I will include in the AI website because I think this is fantastic. Job descriptions are great, but job descriptions, the problem with job descriptions are too long. Uh, they're necessary for different purposes, but I believe when you're recruiting, you need a mud map and you need a one pager that you can consistently revisit during the process. Take this in as much as you can on screen because I'll mention it quite a few times during the course of the presentation. Because we, when we're recruiting roles, we constantly go back to this. This is our blueprint. So we internally, we call this our blueprint, right? So we send a position spec to the, to the client, which is all reams of paper and all the rest of it. And they go, yeah, fantastic. You describe as well. This either on paper or in mind is our blueprint. And really what you're trying to nail is what knowledge and technical skills and experience does this person absolutely have to have to do this role? And then what's desirable? And be careful what you put in essential. Because what you put in Essential might be Roger Federer or Pete Sampras, and what you put in Desire might be Nadal. Have a think about your surface and where you're going to put things. And have things even, I often just have things sitting across the line, the middle line, so you're not fixated and filtering it too much. And then the last thing is almost saying to yourself, what would this person achieve in the first 12 months that would have them be a top performer? So let's say you're recruiting a business development manager, and your business development team normally have a budget of between 1 and 1.5. So you might say, you know what, if this person's at the upper end of that in their first year as a BD, they would be a top performer. 
they would have the chance to be a top performer in the company going forward. You may never share this with the candidate, but it gives you a sense of measure for what you're going to look for when you're out in the marketplace. Because you don't want to put it in front of a candidate and the candidate goes, that's impossible, I don't want the job. But you want some kind of measure. You're trying to bring a little bit of objectivity to a subjective. So then you start developing your pool. Right, so what we've done so far is all anticipating the need and it's all about cloning your stars and all about knowing your surface and then you're starting to go to market. Now that might look like, I don't know how long it looks like, it might look like two weeks work, it's not. It really is about a day's work in between all your roles to get that, you know, plan your work and then work your plan. So that, that, that first part I believe is the slab. Then you want to develop your pool and you're planning your hunt. A lot of companies might do a little bit of what I just showed you and then they just go for right and add off we go. Um, you really got to think about how are we going to go about it? Like, how are we going to do this? Uh, are, are we going to advertise? Are we going to talk to our staff and get internal referrals? Are we going to go to press? Are we going to go national? Are we, you know, you got to design some kind of broad strategy. You don't necessarily need to stick to the absolute, you know, T's and I's of it, but you really want to get a feel for how you're going to go about it. Who? Um, and I've got that dash choosing recruiters. Um, one of the things that I've, I've noticed in, in our industry is you're all too trusting because uh, you're desperate. And I, I mean that, you know, you're just like, oh, yeah, find me staff. My suggestion would be never, ever, ever engage a recruiter without checking them out. I really believe that you're going to spend a lot of money with them. And worse still, you're going to spend a lot of time and waste time if, get, if they get it wrong. So, w you know, I fully expect, and I think any good recruiters, because there's plenty of non-good ones around town, but any good recruiters will expect and be very comfortable with you checking them out. So, the first thing I would say is find a company that matches your values because what we spoke about candidate branding, there's so many companies, and I'm not going to mention any, any organization, recruitment organization names, but there's so many clients who have either consciously or subconsciously done the first part where they're going, yeah, well, this is what we're about, this is our candidate brand, this is how it's going to look, this is the process, and I'll use that analogy again, we're all about relationships, we're all about partnerships, partnerships with our clients, partnerships with our suppliers, we are a firm of endearment, that's what we are. Right, we'll give it to that agency who said they'll flick us 15 CVs in 24 hours, have a field in two days, they don't really care. We're going to send those candidates to six other companies and the highest bidder wins. So you've just now gone from a relationship candidate brand and given it to a very transactional driven organization. And my belief is that transactional driven organizations attract transactionally driven candidates. And relationship based organizations attract relationship based candidates. You want the relationship based candidate. So you really got to give some thought to who you're partnering with. Uh, no different than picking a marketing agency, or picking an IT supplier, or picking a legal firm. We are too under scrutinized. Our industry is not regulated. Anyone tomorrow could go, gee, that Briscoe was all right, I'm going to go start a recruitment company, and you'd have to start by that afternoon. Uh, I think that's disgrace, personally. I think companies spend far too much money in our industry and for our industry not to have a professional regulation beyond our CSA membership. But that's a soapbox for a different night. The important thing for you as clients is knowing how to choose them. And just say, you know, if you're a company with 100 staff, you say, can you just give me two clients that you've done work for in the last six months with about 100 staff that I could talk to and their phone numbers? A good recruiter will give you that on the spot. A bad recruiter will shuffle, shift, go, uh, we don't really like doing that. Why not? You're in the business of reference checking. You won't let me reference check you. I really encourage it because you're going to spend too much money and worse still time. It's really important. When, just draw up a plan or have your partner draw up a plan. Um, I think a lot of recruitment happens without a timeline attached. I think it's pretty important to have a timeline. And that, what that does is it shows the candidate structure as well. And where, where are you going to go? So writing great ads, this is, again, just really, really quick. It's like one minute in writing great ads. A few little rules, I believe. Don't describe, don't oversell, just sell. Has anyone noticed how many times you open the West on a Saturday and it looks like someone just grabbed a job description off Microsoft Word and control v it into an ad? You know, control c control v advertising, I call it. And you're like, oh, okay. I know what sheet of newspaper I'm going to use to keep the, keep the floor <laughs> dry if it rains today. So you really want to make sure that you sell. You don't oversell, you don't describe yourself. Clean, catchy, and different, but with limits, right? You don't want to make it too nouveau because it might just turn people off or it might sound incredible. And here's my golden tip. Uh, anyone that works in our business knows this. Top three, top three, top three. 
If that's all you did with writing ads, you'd write much better ads. What are the best three things about working for your company? Remember what your top performers told you. Whatever they wear, that's what you regurgitate in the ad. If, if you see the pattern and you believe them and you've road tested it. Paragraph one, best three things about working for the company. Paragraph two, best three things about the role. Paragraph three, top three things about the best candidate. In rough terms, how many, anyone here would feel that they write ads that way? Just for me to get a sense of, would they write ads using those top threes or trying to talk about the company? Can people see how that is a lot more powerful based on the research you've done than just copy and pasting a job description? I always use the example, Lexus don't run an ad in the West Australian and describe to you how the engine works and how the hinges of the boot open and how when you close the door there's this little latch that just clicks. They tell you how it's going to feel to own a Lexus. They tell you how it's going to feel when you drive it. Yet ads are just like describe overloads for jobs. So have a little think about it. You will, this, is, this is practice, practice, practice and you will get better at it. But in a bland world, in a labor short market, you want to be the ad that catches the attention. That is the first part of it. You just want to give some other examples about aesthetics. So, um, you know, you, you heard one of our clients is Alcock Brand Needs Group, and that's an ad for Dale Alcock Homes. That was when they just built a new facility, and it was, it was very grandiose in, in, in the marketplace. The marketing manager ad, we, we filled that with a 28-year-old from Foster's, which is no accident considering what we put in the ad. That was the idea. Um, and that was, that was for a capital equipment company, believe it or not. They wanted someone out of that kind of FMCG dynamic environment to really bring their marketing to the next level. I could spend three hours talking about international recruitment. I'm going to spend about a minute. Um, the reason I bring international recruitment up is that, you know, you are going to be competing with an ever-decreasing pool of candidates in WA and in Australia. And we do say in our business that it's easy to move someone across the equator than the Nullarbor. It's very hard to get people from Sydney and Melbourne and Brisbane to move to Perth. Is that a fair comment? So there's a very obvious other place. Now, I've used the UK and Ireland as a map, but you know, we go to South Africa, we go to Canada, but the UK and Ireland is a very obvious place right now for certain disciplines, and they're dying to move. There's things that you've got to consider. What I would say is, whether it's, whether it's a, a friend who's a migration agent, whether it's a, an agency that specializes in international recruitment, this is a minefield if you get it wrong. And you can end up just going, oh God. You know, so I'm throwing a big qualification and a caveat mTOR into this slide saying, if done well, this is phenomenal, phenomenally successful. If done badly, it will drive you potty. The things to think about is how are you going to find them? How will they fit because they're into a new company? the timing of it, uh, visa, and obviously there's, there's migration uh, considerations, and there's lots of migration agents around that are relatively inexpensive to use, and then the cost. I'm not suggesting those five are issues, but they are considerations. My advice, honestly, my advice is don't try it at home unless you've got a professional with you, or you're from that neck of the woods yourself, or you've got someone in your business that understands the marketplace. And except you're not going to get it right all the time. But the reward you get is supply, and this is it's the only economic chart I'll put up here, but just as an example, <clears throat> Ireland's got 13.9% unemployment at the moment, highly qualified uh, population, largely in engineering, construction, but a lot of professional services, legal, financial, insurance. UK is 7.9%, um, and UK is its highest unemployment rate since mid-96. WA I just inserted in there, which is 4.2, uh, so you can see we, you know, four times the supply in Ireland, two times the supply in, in, in the UK with a combined population of 65 million. So it doesn't take you long through the maths to work out where the supply is. If it's managed correctly and if you do it well, it can give you an unbelievable access to candidates. Then, you're, then we're starting to move to assess the candidates. So I just thought I'd put a few pointers in about interviewing. And some of them are really simple. I think a lot of interviews are made complicated because the, the, the bits that were really important got missed. Venue and time, it's amazing how many clients forget about this. Anyone that studied communication at a basic level, you'd always would have heard that the, the message is, it's so important about the message base and the background noise and the time of your message and how tired are people when you're conveying your message. Anyone remember that and communicate? It was all like communication 101. Yet, so many clients, because of work pressures, end up interviewing a guy at six o'clock at night when he's had a big day and it's very frustrated and he's a bit knackered and you want to see energy and you wonder why he's got no energy. Or we're often down in the terrace meeting people. 
and we see these interviews happening in like Chino to go, where the next table's about there away from you, and you're trying to talk to a guy about his future. You wonder why he's not opening up, right? Venue and time is so important. Just be mindful of it. Uh, if, if you're looking for someone that you want to see, if a lot of your work, let's say you're running a, uh, use a silly example, let's say you're running a, a, a telesales or a call center environment where a lot of your calls are made in the morning, interview in the morning. Find out what people's energy loads are like in the morning. Don't interview at six o'clock at night and go, he'd be brilliant at nine in the morning. How do you know? So it's a very, it's a very simple uh, example, but really give, give that some thought. This does not mean allow them to act. This means allow them to perform in an environment similar to what you're going to have them in. So a few don'ts. Um, anyone that's in our industry, I, I firmly believe this, our industry is famous for overpowering candidates. And, and, and almost in a, in a subconscious way, the candidate never got the stage to perform because the recruiter got all powerful. I'm interviewing an engineer who's quiet. I tone it right down. I mirror. I get down to the real considered you know, slower talking, non-excited level and allow him or her to open up and then we're okay. What happens a lot is you've killed the interview in the first five minutes. Questionnaires are a must, a must. How many, oh no, I won't ask. I was gonna say, how many people just go into this? Uh, ah, come on, we're all, we're all human. How many people just go into interview, interview with just the CV and you write on the back of the CV? How many people go into CV in a piece of blank paper? How many would use questionnaires that are quite generic? How many people would use behavioral job specific questionnaires? Good. They're a must. And they should be based in your competency matrix. So for example, if one of your, if one of your essentials around technical skills was, um, you know, you're recruiting, let's say an engineer, and one of your technical skills really is, I really want to make sure this person understands project scheduling. You've got to ask questions around project scheduling. It's a very obvious statement, but it's amazing how many clients miss it and end up having a chat because it's more comfortable. Ah, let's just have a chat. You're not recruiting out of your competency matrix. You're, you are absolutely recruiting a personality, but you're allowed to have multiple stages of your process. You're allowed to do the social coffee where you get a feel of who the person's like in a social environment, but also don't ignore the fact that you've got to get an idea of whether the person meets your competency matrix. You know, this, this, is, this is obviously this is the last slide, but sometimes the, mo the last point, sometimes the most important. The candidate is interviewing you as well as you interviewing the candidate. If you don't give the candidate the space to interview you, they will feel like they have an undelivered communication in the process. Now, there's a difference between being interviewed and being interrogated, and you've obviously got to control interrogation, right? Particularly if you're interviewing a competitor, and I understand all that. There's, you go in forewarned on that, you'll know if someone's just trying to take IP. But it is really important to understand, particularly in the market, I believe, for the next six or seven years, candidates are either going to have or they will have the feeling of embarrassment of choice. Is that fair? You know, at any level. They'll go, oh, it's my third interview this week. Let's see. You've got to give the, the, the person and the interviewee the chance to understand what you're about. What makes top performers want to work in your company? See how powerful that cloning of performers is and the answers that you've got to that? It's like you can share that with a candidate. The candidate goes, I've never been told that before. This is what makes our top performers work in here. This is what they love about here. This is what we're working on stopping doing to let our top performers perform even better. Can you see how a candidate would be, gee, this company's got it together, rather than have you any questions? You know, what's, what's the parking like? Yeah, it's good. So, and, and often that's where interview dies its death because the candidate didn't know what they were allowed to ask. So really allow that two way. This is um, a candidate rating chart that I think is extremely powerful again because you, you know when you're at the end of interviews and your guts kind of say, oh, yeah, he, he looked really good. I can't really decide between him and him. And I, I think he was, you know, he was nice. He lives closer. Well, again, your competency matrix gave you your essentials. And this, is, this is just an example. This is actually... Um, very uh, relevant because this is what we use when we're recruiting our senior consultants. So we look for track record in industry, credible client portfolio, team player, creative and innovative, and ambitious and strong will to win. And then we put importance against them. And then we rank each of the candidates. So, you know, just boring you with the tennis analogy. Uh, I thought I'd stick to one because us Irish are known to go off on tangents with different things. But this allows you, and, and it doesn't mean that you're going to recruit Nadal. It, it doesn't go up, oh, all right, I love Feder, but now nah, we're going to doubt. It's not meant to overtake your good feeling. But what it is meant to do is, again, give you some measurable and give you some objectivity. 
around the process. Because I don't know how you guys feel, you, you know when you've done, let's say, five interviews in a day, and you're just like, what was the first guy like again? I think he was good. So often what happens is you can have this candidate rating chart, and at the end of an interview, you fill it in for that person, based on your competency matrix. And it re I believe it makes decisions a lot clearer. Uh, it, it doesn't solve, you know, uh, uh, can't pick between two candidates for you, but it really makes it a lot clearer in what you're after. As you can see, the, the candidates are scored, first of all, the top three are scored in relation to the, the high important ones, um, and they're scored in relation to, to uh, the total. I must say, every single time I've used this for a client, we've nailed it. And we don't use it every single time, we get bold. But every single, you know, I used to always use this when I went interstate because I felt, it was, oh, I paid for my flights, so I better guess it's right. <laughs> and, uh, but I'd also be sitting down at dinner in Brisbane and I'd be on my own and, you know, I had no friends. Uh, no, but I was sitting down the first half hour and I'd just score it because I just, with so much going on, I was traveling and I was in a strange environment and I'd score it. And I was just unbelievable clarity. Unbelievable clarity if you're a recruiter in an agency or you're a recruiter in your company and you've got to go back and present your findings to the executive it gives you fantastic clarity to be able to describe the shortlist and how you see. I'm just gonna click, I think the PowerPoint might have just skipped a slide, no it didn't, great. Preferred candidate stage. Now, I'm gonna talk about this first. How many people have had the experience where you've thought you've had this brilliant recruitment process, you've got this great candidate, offer him, he says no, he's gone. And you've got to start again. Can I, anyone relate to that? I just wanna get a feel of what I'm talking to in the room. So lots of people. Now, it's, Here's the good news, it's not always your fault. It happens to the best of us, right? Sometimes things happen outside your control. But this is what I spoke about when I looked at the SEEK survey, is that the more you can get into a candidate's world, we've got, we, we've got a few senior consultants in our business who are phenomenal at it. The risk of naming and shaming, Paula Hendrick, who's a part of the business, has a 100% success rate with us at offer stage to placement. It's scary. But Paul, one of Paula's key skills is getting into a candidate's world during a process. And a great question to ask a candidate through the process is, at the end of an interview stage, if you thought this person's strong, you would say, listen, we're moving forward with a couple of people. But if you were offered the role tomorrow, what would come up for you that might prevent you taking the role? Or if you were offered the role tomorrow, how would you feel about it? Instinctively, how would it sit with you? Because you know what happens? You interview them, they go away, they're in some other place, home, office, you ref check them by phone, you offer them by phone, and you offer them officially by email. You never get to see them. Is that fair? Yet, imagine if you're trying to buy a car and, you, and the salesperson was trying to sell to you over the phone or by email. Zero percent success rate. Uh, I, I would just say, just have a rule. Offer face to face. Always. It doesn't cost much. If the candidate's interested, they'll get to you offer face to face, look in the white of their eyes and get a feeling for what's gone off them. Because the second biggest move, well, it, there's two big moves in life, moving house, moving jobs. Really, right? Moving countries, obviously, but moving house, moving job. It is a stressful experience. Often it has nothing to do with you. It has got everything to do with their comfort zone. And I often say in our business, we've got to be slightly more powerful in that direction than their comfort zone is in that direction. All right? Because comfort zones imprison people, but they're very natural. And all of a sudden, what usually happens is they just can't handle it anymore and they're bursting and they spill the beans to their boss. Oh, I'm looking at a job. Right? I'm at reference check stage. I think they might offer me. Right? Like they've just had a gun pointed at them and the boss goes, I'll give you 10 grand. They go, great, I'll stay. Right? It's just comfort zone. We get it all the time. We get it all the time. Oh, I just thought I'd tell my boss I was thinking of leaving. We're like, that's not a great move. But it, we're okay with it, right? But all it is is the candidate's comfort zone. And you just got to be a bit stronger than that. So... Reference check stage, again, was examples of great references and bad references. I believe a really bad, and we just had, I had a joke with one of the consultants today because we were talking about a reference check question. A bad reference check question for me is something like, and was the person always reliable and punctual? Oh, what do you say to that? I think so. Uh, right? Again, competency matrix. Mr. Referee, I need this person to be very strong in this area. How would you rate their skills in that area? Can you give me an example where that came up for them in the business and how they dealt with it? I need, this, I need this project manager to really understand project scheduling. How would you describe his project scheduling skills? Competency matrix. What are your essentials? What happens is you've interviewed out of all these essentials and you ask the reference check, the referee, 
How was he? Would you rehire him? You don't know if the referee that he was, it was clay or grass. You need to describe your surface to the referee and then allow the referee to tell you whether the person's good. See the difference? It's seismic. Because the person's going to sell you Roger Federer and you're like, I never mentioned we play on clay. So you've really, that competency matrix becomes your blueprint that you keep revisiting during the process. And offer an acceptance stage I've just spoken about. The more you're in the candidate's world, the more chance you have of that going smoothly, I believe. And it won't, it will very rarely be about money. People say they're moving for the money. No one ever really comes into us. And, and you know, we operate at that 80 grand to 500 grand level. And it's a broad range, right? No one really ever comes into us. I'm thinking of leaving because I'm paid 10 grand less than I think I'm worth. Ever. Yet offers become about money. People leave jobs because they go, oh, my manager stinks. I don't like the environment. I've hit a glass ceiling. I'm not getting developed. They won't give me my work-life balance. I don't see my kids. Oh, and by the way, I'd like three grand more. No one ever does that. Yet everyone at offer stage just starts to concentrate on the dollars because it's the only thing tangible. But it's not. If you get into the candidate world, you'll get a lot more that's tangible. So you've done all that, right? And one of the things I said in, in, in you know, the presentation is uh, how you can create a dramatic competitive advantage. So I want you to almost picture your competitors, and I want you to picture your own business. I want you to picture that if you knew what your surface was, and you knew who loves playing on my surface, my top performers, who loves, who are they, and what are they as motivating, to, what, what are their motivators that really allow them to love our surface? You then know how to attract others to that surface. Let's go for a game of tennis on clay and people come running. You know how to do that, right? And this is often, I suppose, the, the, towards the developed part of the journey when you've really started to put this into practice. You know how to test them on the surface. Once you've got someone in that says, oh, I want to play, I'll be bright on that surface, you know how to test them. interviewing. You know how to welcome them to the court, which is what we're going to co concentrate on next. But this slide's really good now because it shows you how you just soar ahead of your competitors around talent when you get this right. So you know how to welcome them to the court. They don't get, they don't get to the court and go, oh, someone told me it was doubles. I'm not fit enough for something. I might go back to the grass. So you know how to get them to the court. You know how to keep them on it longer. You're getting 10% extra retention. So you're saving yourself 18 grand a staff member a year. Guaranteed. Guarantee it, because I don't think, you know, I think 20% of businesses know this. So I guarantee you'd know much more than your competitors. You're still going to get it wrong, but a lot less. And we're only talking 10%. So let's just spend a bit of time on retention before I uh, throw it out to questions. It's, it, it's achieved in two stages. And the reason why I got this down is hour one day, one week, one month, one. I'm going to talk about retention from a recruitment perspective. There's lots of companies that will talk to you about retention from a HR perspective ongoingly, and I know a lot of HR people will be involved in employee, employee retention strategies. Our belief is buyer's remorse happens twice. It's one of the few transactions in life, I think, where it happens twice. Buyer's remorse, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll say it in the way I understand it, is the tinge of regret you get straight after you make a purchase. I think candidates get it when they sign the offer, and I think they get it again when they start. And it might be momentary. You want it to be momentary. We do get a lot of candidates that will ring us and go, hey, you know that job you talked to me about? I just started this other job, and it's only day three, but um, I'm just not sure, right? So you've got to understand buyers or more happens twice, and you've got to manage it twice. So it's, it's what are you doing in the first hour of the person's presence in your company that's made them feel comfortable? Everyone's heard about that statistics, like 72% of the first impressions made in the first 30 seconds. What is the first 30 seconds of a new recruit in your business? What's the first day, right? Everyone hates being the new person. Day one is a bit of a watershed. What are you doing for the person in day one, week one, and month one? And whatever it is, they don't need to be hard systems, but it's just care and mindfulness that you're creating so that you're really getting their attention. And then after that, of course, other stuff needs to be done. But boy, you've got a lot done by here. You get this right, and you've integrated the newcomer so that I, I believe you know you've integrated the newcomer when they stop calling themselves a newcomer. You know, and I like that. I like if we've got people in our business and they're with us four weeks and they go, oh, I feel like I've been here six months. But I hear the positivity of it. You want to get rid of the newcomer in that as soon as possible. So here's your seven point talent plan. I'm going to ask you guys to try and stick to the numbers here, right? Because this is just the whole thing in, in entirety. Know your surface, clone your stars. Uh, by the way, we've included a calendar for you. 
uh, which has the seven point talent plan because it will stare at you every day in your desk, right? So it's just a financial year calendar. So it starts 1st of July. Um, actually specially printed for tonight with the July. So it just sits on your desk and you can look at the seven point talent plan. It's just really prompting. Define the role, define the process. Don't try and recruit without a brief because you're throwing darts in the dark. So many people do it. Develop, develop the pool and attract top candidates. And that's really all about planning your hunt and it's about writing great ads. But also, and, and again, I mentioned it earlier on, it's not just about advertising. How are you encouraging your existing staff to refer people? About 80% of our 20 have been found through people we know in the marketplace. That might be unusual for a company who gets used a lot by companies, other companies to recruit staff for them, but it's very, very important as well. Assess candidates through smart interviewing. That's obvious, and we've spoken about that, and there's a huge amount more on that as well. Do your checking and close the deal, all right? Deal gets closed long before you try and close the deal. It will never be closed if you've missed something on the way. Integrate the newcomer, which we just spoke about. And then number seven really could be number one. You know, it, this is all about continuous improvement. And, and even for someone like ourselves, we're constantly looking at how we do it better. So get better every day and build your brand. Everyone's got a brand. If you're a, a, an organization with two staff, you have a brand. The brand is basically the values that you can put out in the marketplace that encourages that third person to join your team. And they're the most important in your business at times because they're the first followers. Um, I know I probably make it sound easy. It isn't. Uh, we don't find it easy. I always use the analogy of James Heard looked like he had so much time on the ball because he was a master of the sport. You will get better at this. Um, and I, I really believe that you put this plan in place, you are dramatically more likely to recruit and retain good staff for your business. Thank you very much.